Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Amen. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 We, we can be glad and rejoice in the Lord. The times are tumultuous, <clears throat> and uh, you know we're compa compassed about with much infirmity and uh, different afflictions and persecutions to some degree or another. And yet we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And Jesus loves us. Amen. And for that I rejoice. Amen. I think it was Richard Wormbron. Well, before I get started, perhaps I should pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, to strengthen me with might by your spirit and the inner man. That you'd help me to speak as the oracles of God. That you'd grant unto all of us here a... Uh, a dispensation of the spirit of truth <clears throat> to help us to understand and to comprehend the fullness of what you have for us tonight. And we want to welcome Jesus amongst us because when two or three are gathered together in his name, he has said that he is in the midst and we believe that. Amen. So we welcome you, Lord Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, to minister to us. Amen. Amen. So I think it was Richard Wormbron who said, the Word of God is truth. Doctrine is truth about truth. And theology is truth about truth about truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's true. And all of that is true. And it's not a bad thing necessarily. Right. You know, as you get away from truth and you process it, you uh, either sharpen it and make it more useful to you to understand or to convey to somebody else, or you create confusion, depending on the degree that you really understand what you're talking about. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees had doctrines, mm -hmm. and they sought to teach their doctrines. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Jesus showed up, who was the Word of God, <clears throat> and he smoked them. You know, they didn't really understand anything. Mm -hmm. And what they even thought they understood proved not to be true. Mm -hmm. And the life of Jesus Christ in their presence exposed what they really thought and what they really believed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And theology can be good too. You know, theology is the study of God. Yeah. God doesn't have to study himself. He knows everything about himself. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we attempt to, to understand God. And we break little aspects of God down into parts so that we can get a, a grasp of them. You know, Paul himself, who was a theologian, said that I might apprehend that for which I am apprehended of God. He wanted to get his mind, the mind of Christ that he was given, wrapped around the truths that were being revealed to him. And it was a very difficult and hard to be understood uh, process mm -hmm. for the people around him. And Peter makes reference to that in the end of one of his epistles. Mm -hmm. He said he canonized basically the scriptures that Paul created by writing his epistles. And Peter's remarks were, these are things that are difficult to be understood, and those that are unlearned rest them, or they, they wrestle them and twist them to their own destruction. So, Anybody that's ever worked with a, a lever and a fulcrum, if you put a fulcrum down in front of something that you'd like to move, and you, and you put that lever down, you know, Archimedes said, you know, give me a place to put the fulcrum and I can move the world. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. But you got to know what you're levering. Mm -hmm. And so there's a distillation of the Word of God becomes what we call doctrine. Mm -hmm. You know, my speech, my, my speech shall uh, drop as a rain, my, no, my doctrine shall drop as a rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, mm -hmm. Moses says. Mm -hmm. So there's a distillation. When you distill something, you concentrate it. Wow. Okay? But mm -hmm. if your chemistry is off, you make a mess. <laughs> so it, it takes some degree of expertise and knowledge of what you're doing. So again, I'm not trying to say that truth about truth about truth is useless. It's, it can be used very profitably. 
But it's something to be, you know, dealt with. There are nuances that, that you have to really think about. And I was reading in the, the fifth chapter of John, and I got a scripture, which I'm going to read to you right now, but then I'm going to go back and work back to it so that you'll, you'll see where I'm going. And that scripture is John chapter 5, and Jesus is talking to people that had difficulty with the way he did things. And he was probing them and seeing what they really believed, and, you know, they were said to be seekers after God. But by the end of it, you could tell that they weren't seeking God at all. They had a different motive in mind. And in verse 39 of, of John chapter 5, he says this, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Isn't that why we read the Bible? I mean, we, we search the scriptures because we know that, that the, the learning of the scriptures is very profitable. Stan has told us, told us about his Alexander Scorby uh, situation where he listens to it all the time. Very profitable. I mean, you're getting steeped in the Word of God. But if that's done without the proper spirit behind it, it can ruin you. Absolutely. Okay? So you can either become a Pharisee or you can become a very profound, deep disciple of Jesus Christ, depending on how you set your lever, depending on how you distill what it is that you're hearing. Amen. And that's why the Holy Ghost is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Because He leads us and guides us into all truth. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that. Search the Scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Remember, the Word of God is truth. Mm -hmm. What is truth? Jesus. My Word. My your, word. your Word, O Lord. <laughs> it's truth. What is truth? Right? Yeah. I think it's Psalm 119. Thy Word, O God, is truth. Mm -hmm. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. So truth, or the word of God, is light. And light makes manifest. Yes. It exposes. It reveals. Hallelujah. That's the word. And that's why it's profitable to, to search out the scriptures and find out what they say. Absolutely. But he said, here, search them. For in them you think you have eternal life, and is they which testify of me. Yeah, point so to they point to him. There's something even stronger than the written word, mm -hmm. and that's the living word. Yeah, yeah. And he was the living word of God made manifest. Yeah, yeah. And it's so important because I, I want to talk to you about Urim and Thummim, these things that were contained on the high priest's breastplate close to his heart. And... Um, what Jonathan had to say about priesthood and sonship being equivalent, if you look at Hebrews and refer to what he preached about that, you'll see that that's true. You know, now are we the sons of God. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. And so, now you're sons by faith. Now you are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek by faith. You know, the Lord has sworn. He's not going to repent, but what about you? Right. Do you believe it? Be it according to your faith. You know, once the Lord has spoken, well, He's already spoken. Yes. You know, if, you, if you're condemned, it's all over anyway. Mm -hmm. If you're saved, then you are saved, but the only thing that matters is do you believe that? Yeah. And he has promised to bring us through to a perfected end. The thoughts that I have for you are thoughts of peace and not of evil, that you might have an expected end, that you might have tikvah, that you might have hope. So you know, God's desire for us is a good desire. Mm -hmm. we got to go through lots of things to get there. It's through much tribulation that we enter Amen. into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's part of the idea of thumim. Urim is oracular brilliance or light. And a light came into the world. Who was that light? Jesus. Jesus. He's the light of the world. And now you're the light of the world, right? Sure. You are the light of the world insofar as you're walking in the, the commandments of Jesus Christ and being led of His Spirit. 
You're the light of the world. Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus says to Philip, how long have I been with you? And you don't understand the simple truth that when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And our aspiration is that when they see us, they see Jesus. Now, we understand this. Jesus was given the Spirit without measure. Amen. Yeah. We get the Holy Ghost in a measure, depending on what God ha wants to use us for and how He uses us and what part of the body of Christ we are. Cumulatively altogether, we have the Spirit without measure. But individually, we're, we're not the whole shebang, right? We're not the whole uh, steamboat. We have to have each other, members in particular, members in particular yeah, yeah. and important members. Mm -hmm. And not all members have the same office, and not all people have the same grace, and not all people have the same gifts. But if you put it all together, mm -hmm. it's yeah, a complete work, it. complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. So you see the, mm -hmm. the where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You know, go to a Bible preaching church. That's not enough. No. Yeah. You know, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead, being alone. Mm -hmm. We need the Holy Ghost, and we need the Word of God working together yeah. to manifest Christ. Otherwise, apart from Him, we can do nothing. Yeah. Stan was rather direct about showing that without the grace of God working in us. We don't have anything in ourselves mm -hmm. to recommend us to anybody, especially not to God. No, amen. You often quote that scripture. He actually said the power. Amen. We power. have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. Now, Jesus Christ came in the same kind of earthen vessel. Mm -hmm. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. It says in Hebrews that it behooved him to be, be like unto his brethren. Why? So that he could experience the temptations that God couldn't. Yeah, amen. God the Father. Right. Now we have Melchizedek, high priest. And that's the order of priesthood that we're a part of yes. in reality. Yes, you know, and that's Jesus Christ's priesthood. Mm -hmm. Because as you go through the, the scriptures, you begin with Genesis and you work forward. At every place, there's a revealing. Yes. There's a revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, the, the, the last book is called the Apocalypse. And we, we think Apocalypse means, you know, everything gets blown apart and goes on fire. Well, that's part of it. But the Apocalypse simply means the revelation mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen. He's coming in yeah. flaming fire, yeah. mm -hmm. taking vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the, the, His Scriptures. The book of Revelation. So... I can see how people would mess that up. But for us, the revelation of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, has been a progressive thing. It has progressed. He'll show us one thing. He'll show us another thing. He'll show us another thing. Melchizedek was amongst the people as a high priest and as a righteous king. And yet, because of his form, he could not be tempted like that. And because God is so just, remember, that's the important thing about salvation, God's justice. Amen. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Amen. Because Jesus, who was Amen. the righteous one, has paid every debt, not only for each of us here, but for everyone in the whole world from the beginning of time yeah. until the end. The, the only thing that matters is that you believe that. Yeah. And the only way you can believe that is by grace through faith. And guess what? That's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. And so you have all these, these issues of doctrine. Well, do we have free will? Is there an election according to the election of grace? Is it whosoever will surely meaneth me? What? Where do you put your fulcrum? Where do you put your lever to exploit these truths? Well, you have to have some wisdom behind it. And that's where the spirit of truth comes in. So let's go back to... Uh, the beginning of John chapter 5 and uh, the first part of it pertains to the man that had been lying there for, for 38 years 
and Jesus heals him. And wilt thou be made whole? And the guy made excuses, and Jesus said, answer the question. Do you want to be made whole? Yeah. And it's got nothing to do with angels, movements, any of that kind of stuff. It's got to do with me. Yeah. Amen. The power of God is present to heal because I'm here. And the guy had faith yeah. in spite of his sinfulness. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even know it was Jesus that healed him. <laughs> Nope. Did not know. The Pharisees wanted to say, hey, hey, who did this? Sabbath day, what's going on here? Right. This is against our doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it was in that context that Jesus came back to him and, and said to him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. That's when he learned it was Jesus. That's when he found out it was Jesus. And right. then what did he do? The man departed and told right. the Jews that it was Jesus, right. which had made him whole. Right. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now listen to this next scripture. Verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh herein, hitherto, and I work. You see what he was doing here? He said, You're offended that I healed on the Sabbath day. You're offended with God because I can't do this by myself. My father worked and he wanted to heal this man on this day. Mm -hmm. And so I did it because I'm the obedient son. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he, he threw that right in their face. Mm -hmm. You know, That's you're going you're gonna to accuse God of breaking the Sabbath? Right. Well, sure they are because yeah. they're accusing Jesus of it. Second yeah. <laughs> Timothy 2, verses um, 6 and 7. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give ye understanding in all things. And this admonition Paul was telling the young preacher Timothy, before you try to expect anybody else to do anything, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. You can't command people to do a thing and, and be non-obedient in that area. That's why sanctification is so important. You know, we can all say, well, you know, I'm weak, this, that, and the other. Well, how can you expect anybody else to toe the line if you yourself don't toe it? So the preachers, above all other things, knowing their own infirmities, knowing their own weaknesses after the flesh, really have to press in and believe that God's going to help them. Absolutely. Because the Word of God is the Word of God. You have to right. preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So you have to do these things, but you can't do it if you yourself are compromised. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to, to press in to believe that God will perfect you. Right. And, and we do. Amen. We believe that. Absolutely. You know, Amen, we believe that God is perfecting God. Let us go on to perfection. Mm -hmm. And this shall we do if God permit. And He does. He works it all out for us. But the husbandman that laboreth, it says that uh, my father worketh, he's laboring, yeah, must be the first partaker of the fruits, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the vine, my father is the husbandman. So he, he's working. Yeah, in the, he knows he's a wise husbandman. He knows what the vine needs. Mm -hmm. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 5, he talks about planting a vineyard in a very fruitful hill mm -hmm. and digging it in and getting all the rocks out and building a tower and putting in the wine vat and making sure everything was right. And then he put in the choices of vines and what did he end up getting? Wild grapes. Mm -hmm. And I said, what yeah. more do you want me to do about this? Mm -hmm. So he, he's been engaged mm -hmm. in the work of salvation for a long time. Yeah, he's the husbandman. James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until it receive the early and latter rain. Yeah, yeah. And we, we have. <laughs> We're coming to the end of what was considered the latter rain or the, the second outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so we have everything we need. You don't need to hear another word preached to you if you'll apply yourself to knowledge. 
and believe the things that you've heard. Right. Now, because of the infirmity of our flesh, we come back to hear preaching and we get it again and again because we let things slip. Mm -hmm. We are subject to uh, attacks of unbelief. Mm -hmm. There is a demonic uh, world that is trying to subvert us. Mm -hmm. So, understanding all these things, that's why God insists that we preach and remember and exhort one another with these things all the time. But my, my point here is that God is the husband. Yeah, absolutely. He's the one that's working. And the son says, when I see my father working, I'm going to do what he does. He's working too. And so we in like manner, when we see Jesus working, we should do the same thing. We should labor to enter into his rest. And we're not working to save ourselves, but we are working to enter into the rest of the salvation that he's already wrought. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because <clears throat> he not only had broken the Sabbath in their estimation, because yeah. he didn't. No. And God didn't break it, and he didn't break it no. by healing this fellow yeah, he with did. the infirmity for 38 years. Because Anna also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. That really bothered him, because yeah. they, they had a monopoly on God in their estimation. They had all the words and all the doctrine correct, and that's when Jesus challenged them. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's going to do here. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. That's what Stan was telling us last week. Amen. Nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. Yeah, amen. Okay, so we're going to be doing something because right. the Father's working. He's doing. He's a husbandman. These also do it the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Mm -hmm. If you go back to uh, the incident between Martha and Jesus. Yeah, I know. He'll, he'll rise on the last day. And Jesus says, you don't understand, Martha. I am the resurrection yeah. and the life. I'm here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're going to see something that's going to fascinate you. Right. Because I'm going to demonstrate that resurrection power even now. Yeah. Amen. So, again, going back to our scripture, search the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is a last day. There is a resurrection of the yeah, just. There is a resurrection of the unjust, separated by a thousand years mm -hmm. and all those things. Martha's doctrine was fine. You're right. But what she did not appreciate was there was something even more than the Word. Mm -hmm. There was the living Word standing in her presence. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. limited to just mm -hmm. the last day. Not limited to the last day. Now is the acceptable time. Behold, yeah. today is the day of salvation. Right. Yeah. So it, it's what can you believe for? Mm -hmm. And what do you need? You know, we have a lot of afflictions, trials, tribulations, pains, aches, all, all these right. things. I'm going to go and show you that that's part and parcel of being part of the high priesthood. Amen. Built into it. Yeah. And yet God's grace is sufficient. Mm -hmm. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Because remember, He's not just trying to heal our physical bodies. No. He's trying to take away every iota of self-will yeah. and pride yeah. and iniquity yeah. so that in glory we're perfect. Mm -hmm. That there will never be a moment that we say like Lucifer did, mm -hmm. I will exalt myself right. ab above yeah, the throne of God. Like He's not going to have it. No. And so all of that's got to be removed from us now. And that inborn iniquity is very uh, sinister. It's, it's very, yes, it wick, very wicked. And uh, sin is very deceitful. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have almost everything right and be blind to a particular thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a man can receive nothing except to be given to him from heaven. Right. God's ready to work on you in a particular area. And yes, you may have that issue. And others may see it, but God's not going to do anything about it because He's doing other things first. 
He's a wise husbandman. He's a wise master builder. Hallelujah. The Father judges no man, but he hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That's, That's profound. Yeah. Now we know that, like uh, Paul said, you know, this is my judgment, yeah. mm -hmm. and I think I have the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was so steeped in what the will of God was, and he was so alienated from implementing his own will, mm -hmm. his ego was not involved, no. mm -hmm. that he could be trusted to render a righteous judgment. Yeah, amen. And that's precisely what the Father backs away. Why? To eliminate the claim in the final judgment that you don't understand God what it's like to be in this sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. But Jesus does. Yeah. Uh -huh. Melchizedek didn't, mm -hmm. but Jesus does. Yeah. Absolutely. He was tempted on all points, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. So, sin. of all the men that ever existed, he's the only one that never sinned. <clears throat> Same flesh as we have. Yeah, a man is tempted, and he was tempted on all points. When he's drawn away of his own lusts, Jesus had lusts, he had desires mm -hmm. that could have been separate from what the Father desired. Mm -hmm. But as a true son, he subordinated his desires to the will of the Father. Yeah, yeah. He crucified his flesh with its affections and lust. And then he finally was crucified, and all of our sins and iniquities were poured on him. And because he... He accepted that. Yeah. The father had to turn his back on him. Mm -hmm. But because he did that, we were able to be saved. Because it's a righteous thing with God. His justice is, is perfect. Mm -hmm. He has to be just. Otherwise, he's not God, as Amen. Jonathan was preaching. So... The Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Mm -hmm. And so, again, back to our scripture. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. Mm -hmm. Everything points to Jesus. Amen. He's the most important thing He's to us me. because there is one mediator mm -hmm. between yeah. God and man, one. the man Christ Jesus. Jesus. Amen. And he's, he's the one yeah, he that we can come to. Now he says, pray to the Father in my name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll be accepted yeah. because of what he did. Mm -hmm. And the Father would freely bestow to you. Why? Because he loves you because you love his son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. So the father was working. You know, he's taking away this, this objection that God, you don't understand what it's like to be in sinful flesh. He said, well, watch this. Yeah. It pleased him that in Jesus Christ all the fullness should dwell. So when you see Jesus, you're seeing the father. Yeah, amen. But he, he handicapped himself, if you will, and put himself in sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. Or as much of God you could just put in a physical body. Amen. And he became very closely and intimately related with the cares and afflictions mm -hmm. and Amen. infirmities of men. And he overcome them. Yeah, he was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. We didn't understand him. Mm -hmm. yeah. him smitten of God. That's right. Amen. I mean, yeah, you must have done something to, to, right. to get all that. Amen. That's right, Sister Yost, you must have done something to fall off that bucket in that hen house to suffer what you've suffered here these last 10 years or 15 okay. years, whatever it's been. Yep, 10 Pe years, for sure. Okay, now, people at the crucifixion mm -hmm. wagged their heads at Jesus. Mm -hmm. they, they scoffed at him. They said, come on down, you know, deliver yourself, so on and so forth. And yet he was doing a profound spiritual work. And that's what I would ask you to do. Yes, pray that God would heal you. And that's good. But understand that as he works out as a good pleasure in your life, he's doing a very deep and a profound work. And we can all claim the same things about areas in our lives. I just cite you because 
we're familiar with your situation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a it's a common situation because of people in flesh. They have infirmities. They suffer pains. Verily, I, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's believing on God, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. In another scripture, it says this. Light has come into the world. This is the condemnation. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They didn't want to change. They didn't want to acknowledge their sinfulness. They didn't want to understand or announce and agree with God their wretchedness. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. He's the resurrection and the life. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> he heard. We know that we pass from death to life because yeah. we love the brethren. Yeah. That's how you can tell. Do you have the love of God in you? Well, if you do, you have the love of the brethren who you can see. Because to claim that you love God whom you can't see and you despise and hate your brothers and sisters... That's not going to wash with God. And so he gives you these things to test yourself with. How do you deal with one another? Are you a lover of God? Well, I know that some days are better than others because of the infirmity of flesh, because of the way things go, because of your place and degree of maturity or perfection, the degree of your sanctification. But I hope we all agree that the pinnacle or the bond is charity. Mm -hmm. Charity is a bond of perfectness. Add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in your bound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. An abundant entrance, an mm -hmm. entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Mm -hmm. That's how I should say that. That's how the scriptures say it. Amen. An entrance. Mm -hmm. It's a straight and narrow gate. But an entrance will be ministered to you abundantly. I think every one of us here can say, we've been in the presence of a lot of good preaching over the years. Oh, yeah. And so there is no lack mm -hmm. of someone sowing the word of God into our lives. And there is no lack of the Holy Ghost bringing agreement to the words of Jesus Christ being yeah. spoken to us. Yeah, yeah. So we have an entrance, yeah. and it's been ministered unto us abundantly. Mm -hmm. Now, even though you know we, we get saved by the skin of our teeth, mm -hmm. it seems like, yeah. there is an entrance. Mm -hmm. And that entrance is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's the door. By Him, we go in. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. For as the Father have life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man, because he experienced everything. Mm -hmm. And you can't lay a charge at him mm -hmm. for not understanding. Mm -hmm. He is a compassionate high priest oh, yes. who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus was weary. He understands weariness. Oh, yeah. You know, he thirsted. He knows all these things that we experience, and he even more so. Sat down at the well. That's right. <laughs> and then he got to work, yeah. working on the, uh, the, the, the woman at the well. Amen. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all they that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Amen. So we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God through Jesus Christ. You know, we've, we've heard the joyful sound, mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus saves. Mm -hmm. And we've responded to that. And so we've, we've passed from death to life. But there's also this, this issue of the resurrection from the dead at the end of our lives. Because, you know, we're appointed to die unless Jesus comes mm -hmm. and, and right. calls us up. So we, we have to, to settle both issues. Yeah. And if you do the one now, you'll have more confidence when it comes to the end. That's for sure.
And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now we know we're not saved through works, but we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which He hath prepared for us, that we should walk in them. <coughs> so they've been prepared, the works have been prepared. And He shows them to us, and then we say, okay, you want me to work in the vineyard? I will work in the vineyard. I will do it. Whatever you show me to do, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And of course, we know the parable. One says, I go and didn't do it. Yeah. The other one mm -hmm. fought, but he reconsidered and he went. Better still is a person that gets to the place where there's no more kickback. They just <laughs> tell me what the will of the Lord is and I will do it. And we have someone that, that tells us that. It's the Holy Ghost. I can of myself, own self, do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. That's profound. I mean, the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, takes more than just one. There is another that beareth witness, witness of me, and I know that that witness which he witnesses of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth, but I receive not the testimony from man. Because mm -hmm. he knows what's in men, even good men, mm -hmm. good men, yeah. men that God's dealing with. Yeah. They're still subject to all kinds of right. corruptions. Their testimonies can be impeached, because you can always look back and say, hey, see when Stan did that? You can't believe anything he says, or me, or Chris, or whomever. And yet, we know that God's working in each of us. We know the things that we go through are for the furtherance of the gospel in us. But for God to have to rely on our testimony in the matter of salvation, it's not good enough. Yes, we can tell somebody, but they have to believe it from God. It's kind of like the woman at the well. She tells the people in her town, hey, come here a man that, that knows everything I ever did. And they came because they understood who she was and knew about her. And then he stayed two days with, with, the, two with, days two with them. Stayed, yeah, and then at the end they said, hey, now we believe because of what he said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We know what you're like. You know, you mm -hmm. might have embellished this. You might have, you know, tooted your own horn. You could have done anything. But... Now we've been in the presence of this very Word of God. And did not our hearts burn within us while He walked with us, by the way? When He spoke unto us the Scriptures, you know, like the road to Emmaus I'm referencing, their hearts burned within them. They had a testimony. They knew something was really true. They didn't need anyone else to tell them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is another that beareth witness of me. I know that the witness that which he witnesses of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth, but I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that you might be saved. That's his intent. He wants to save us. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But because he was a man... You know, you might walk away and say, well, yeah. was it really yeah. everything like that? But when God talks to you, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And you can walk away and people can say this or that about it, and you say, uh-uh. Remember how you preach that? Because I believe it in here. Right here. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody can take that from you. No. No. If you've ever had the born-again experience, I don't care what failures you've experienced in your life or what you look like on one given day. You know what God did. And you have confidence that He's going to finish what He started. Amen. Hallelujah. He'll perform it. Unto the day of salvation. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. 
And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. But Jesus came to make the Father known. So when you've seen him, you have seen the Father. And ye have not his word abiding in you. This is the indictment. For whom he hath sent him, you believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me, that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. That's the litmus test. Mm -hmm. That's how you know. There is no other true religion in the world except Christianity because you have to have the Son. Mm -hmm. If you have the Son, you have the Father. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the Son, you do not have life. Mm -hmm. He that has the Son hath life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another come in his own name, him you will receive, the Antichrist, or any other of the Antichrists that have manifested over the years. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? That's another test. Do you rely on what people think about you? You shouldn't. I mean, life should suffice you to understand that that's a, a fool's errand. Now, we all try at some point to impress people or want to be accepted by people. But it only matters if we're accepted in the Beloved. Yeah, and if we are, then none of this stuff matters to us. We're not looking for acceptance by the world system. We're not trying to impress anybody. Well, the only yeah, person we want to please is our Heavenly Father. Amen. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, yeah. even, Moses, even Moses, in whom you Amen. trust. So and all the Bible thumpers that are thumping this, that, and the other, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, if they're not manifesting Christ, they really don't understand the Word from a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. So again, back to our Scripture. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You now those Pharisees knew the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, when he was still, you know, in the throes of that religious devil, was steeped in the scriptures. He was raised up at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was not a bad guy, as far as guys go. You know, when he heard about Jesus, he says, Had done our, our law, you know, want to hear what the guy has to say? You know, we don't judge him before we hear what he has to say. So, he was fair-minded, if you will. That... Didn't help Jesus much, but it was the Father's plan to send the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And he had to be condemned. And he had to, be, had to be set at naught. He had to be lied on for it to all come to pass. And uh, as he was in the world, so are, so are we. Mm -hmm. So people are going to lie on you. People are going to misunderstand you intentionally. They're going to misrepresent you. They're going to say you're a hypocrite, you're a liar, that you're of your father, the devil, any other things that they'll say. As Chris preached one time, suffer yourself to be defrauded. defrauded. That's right. Remember that. Amen. Amen. And that's another thing. Jesus right. was defrauded, and he opened not his mouth. Yeah, amen. Before his shears, he was dumb. Perfect example. And when someone tries to shear you down, mm -hmm. you know, razor you down with their tongue, with their lies. Yeah. You don't have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. God's your defense. Mm -hmm. If you believe in Him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Now, if you're a religious spirit, you're going to fight. We're going to have a doctrinal battle. Yeah, it's going to be the, the apostolics versus the Trinitarians. Mm -hmm. Or what have you. To yeah, use right. one example. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So what do you believe? Oh, I believe the Bible, 100%, Brother Christopher. Well, that's good. But do you manifest Jesus Christ? 
because he's the word made flesh. And as a Christian, you should be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. When people see you, they should see a representation of him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, <clears throat> we talked about <clears throat> the high priest, the Urim and the Thummim. I love these terms because they're obscure. And I like digging in and finding strange mm -hmm. things that are not really dealt with much. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you try to find a, a, a representation of what they really were, you can't. Mm -hmm. They're said to be a symbolic object in the high priest's breastplate, but they're not described. They're defined, mm -hmm. but they're not described. And, and what you get from there is the Urim, literally means light. Mm -hmm. It's a symbolic object, light, oracular brilliance. Mm -hmm. You know what an oracle is? An oracle is someone that conveys mm -hmm. a god's words. So you have the oracle of Delphi in Greek mythology. And it was always a mystical gobbledygook of, of words that could be understood ten different ways. Is about the oracle of, of Delphi. Mm -hmm. You know? In the Bible it's different. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, which are quite clear, mm -hmm. easy to be understood, mm -hmm. entreatable. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. So on one level, you know, you have religions that have oracles. But they're confounding, they're confusing, they're ambiguous. And so whatever might happen could fit into what they have described. Have you ever heard of Nostradamus? Yeah, oh yeah. He was a French fellow that uh, wrote all these uh, quatrains, or four uh, pairs, or four items that were paired together that uh, described something that was supposed to happen in the future. But they were so ambiguous you know when it comes to pass you say oh this is what he was talking about yeah. Yeah. well maybe or maybe not yeah. or who knows i mean you could drive very a mac truck through yeah. it yeah. and it's 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 very ambiguous but the word of god is not like that no. you know you may not know before it hits but when it hits you know this and this is that like peter says precisely and then he quotes joel and it, it fits to a t you know there's, there's no dispute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the Urim was, a, was in the breastplate of the high priest. Light, oracular brilliance. Now, perhaps, I know this has happened to me. It's got to have happened to all of you one way or another, maybe more than once. When you're reading the scriptures and all of a sudden it looks like it lights up on the page. Or you're out in the garden and you hear Alexander Scorby quote something and you turn around and it hits you in a way that's never hit you before. Mm -hmm. It's like a spotlight came on. Yeah, amen. That's Urim. Yeah, amen. That's oracular brilliance. That's God talking to you. Mm -hmm. He's saying, this specific word for you right now. Yeah, amen. Oracular brilliance. Mm -hmm. And then what came with it was the Thummim. The Thummim was, let me see if I can find my definition to get it precisely right. The emblem of complete truth, perfection. And that was in the high priest's breast, breastplate too. Mm -hmm. The emblem of complete truth. You know, an emblem is like a medallion or a representation. Right. The em when you see it, you know, oh, that's perfect. The emblem of com complete truth. You understand totally and completely. That's likened unto the experience that you go through. You know, light comes into the world. You get a rhema word from God. It illuminates your path. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay. But you haven't walked in it yet. You know what the truth is, and you know you should walk in the truth. But until you go through it, and experience all the pitfalls and the persecutions that come for the word's sake, you don't really have the 
the completeness, the perfection quite yet. Yes, you understand it on one level, but it hasn't made an indelible print on you. You know, you know about embossing machine stand? Mm -hmm. It's a huge stamping machine that has a lot of weight and it comes down and it goes blam and leaves an imprint. Yeah. Well, that's like the Thummim. You go through experiences in your life that leave you indelibly changed, mm -hmm. yeah, that you yeah. are imprinted by God. Mm -hmm. You might say, uh, when Jacob wrestled with the angel, mm -hmm. and he reached out and put, him, put his, his hip out of joint, mm -hmm. he had a, an experience with God yeah, yeah. that changed his life. Absolutely. Hobbled him, probably was not too pleasant you know, to go like that for the rest of your life. But at the end of his life, he's leaning on a, a staff prophesying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to his children. Worshiping God. Worshiping yeah. God. Yeah. You know, so Ain't it was a good thing that his hip was blown out and yeah. he had a staff to lean against and he could prophesy in the name of the Lord yeah. what was going to happen to his children. Mm -hmm. But he, he was able to do that because God made an impression Amen. in his life and it was instrumental in bringing him on to perfection. Amen. Amen. You understand what I'm trying to say here? Um <clears throat> Let's see. First John chapter 5. I won't be too horribly long. Because I just want to read this one and then go through some scriptures that talk about the Urim and Thummim and make a few remarks about that. But uh, First John chapter 5, beginning at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood. Now, the water is the Word. The Word is the Urim. You get something pointed out to you that no one else is getting. You know, a lot of people go to church their whole lives and never get the illumination because God did not chose them. But He's chosen you. To, you know, why do you speak to them in parables, Jesus? Because I don't want them to understand. But you, you're blessed because I want you to understand. So he illuminates that word and it finds entrance. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Urim, it's in there. But that's not enough. you got to get knocked off your high horse. And Paul knew the word as Saul. And then a great light came about him and then knocked him down. Yeah. And he had enough sense to say, uh, what would you have me to do? Amen. And then yeah. the, well, we're going to tell you what things you're going to have to yeah. suffer, Paul. So God added to the illumination the affliction that would make an impression that would bring to perfection that word in his life. Praise the Lord. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So the Spirit takes the things of Jesus. He doesn't speak about himself. He takes the things that Jesus wants important in your life and ministers them right back to you. Praise the Lord. Amen. And this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there, is, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. They all agree. Mm -hmm. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree to one. So God's of one mind, and mm -hmm. who can change it? And uh, sometimes we're double-minded and we try to change it. But we're on the earth and He's in heaven. Mm -hmm. So ultimately your words become few. Mm -hmm. You begin to understand that God is going to do what He's going to do. And uh, all of our complaining, carping, yelling and screaming and dancing around is not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. He wants to get your cooperation. He wants your agreement. Mm -hmm. There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water, and the blood. So the Spirit 
of truth gives you an illuminating Urim word, a Rhema word, and then you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You, you go through an experience that touches you. you know, skin for skin, Satan said of Job, you know, let me touch him and uh, we'll find out what's in this fellow. And God had confidence in, oh, yes. in, in Job oh, because yeah. he knew what he had said about him. A perfect man, feared God to shoot evil, yeah. upright, all those things. <laughs> so God knew what, what was there and what could come through the fire come through the testing, come through the shedding of blood. You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin, but you will. Amen. You will. Yeah. You live in this world, hath ceased from sin. Yeah. Amen, brother. Amen. So there you have that. I think the point's been made. Urim is the, the revelatory word coming to you. Thumim is the uh, procedure that brings an impression in your life that leads to perfection. An indelible stamp, an emblem, is, is, is stamped upon you. You know, you, you have a seal in this forehead, right? So, so we're all on the same page there? Okay. Let's go to Exodus chapter 28, talking about the, the high priest. Aaron and thy brother... And his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And you know that Nadab and Abihu were destroyed in Leviticus chapter 10. They offered up strange fire, mm -hmm. and God wiped them out. Yeah, amen. And uh, that's instructive. You can be a priest and you can be wiped out mm -hmm. if you don't obey and bring the prescribed sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And if you read that account, you find out that you know, Aaron and Moses are offering a sacrifice and God sends down fire and consumes the sacrifice and everybody falls on their face. And then the next account is Nad Nadab and Abihu offering you know, a censer of incense. Yeah, they were looking for some glory, I think. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, when you can do a trick like that and everyone falls on their face, you got a lot of power, right? That gives you some leverage in the community. You can get what you want done. You see how that, that would play on the pride of life yeah. in somebody. Sorcery. You know, and that's why God says, hey, no novices, lest they be puffed up. Puffed up and suffer the same condemnation as the devil. Mm -hmm. you know, pride. We don't talk about pride a whole lot. You know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, but the pride of life. That's a killer. Oh, yeah. And it's something that's got to be totally dealt with as well as those other two in our lives. Yeah, so, Nadab and Abihu, they, they, they bought the farm. Eleazar replaced Aaron when, when he uh, was gathered unto his people. And uh, Ithamar, you know what his name means? Isle of Palms. Peace. Or the coast of palms. You know? right. Like Tamar means palm, oh. palm tree. Ithamar is a, uh, a gathering of palms. Huh. And I thought about the, the psalm that says, The righteous man shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. So the, the palm tree is a, a picture of you know, God's blessing. Mm -hmm. And his provision. And if you have an isle of palms in the desert, what is that? That's an oasis. oasis yeah. And what's underneath? Water. Mm -hmm. And what's in the trees, typically? Dates. Mm -hmm. You know, you get sustenance. Right. So it's a real blessing. I Ithamar, you know, mm -hmm. his name represents all that. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Yes. He glorifies the meek, or beautifies the meek with salvation. He wants to put his glory on his people. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. In that I want you to show the participation of the people, that God singled out wise hearted people to help create these garments. Mm -hmm. You think about 
Isaiah, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. And the ministers of God help to adorn you with beautiful garments due to the wisdom that God grants them. You know, you may feel like you're in filthy rags, but a wise expositor of the scriptures will point out to you the provision that God has made to beautify the meek with salvation. And so there's a, a, a participation of the congregation mm -hmm. in the adorning of the high priest. And so that's kind of like our worship of Jesus mm -hmm. wow. and our living at peace with one another yeah. you know, as a kingdom of, of kings and priests. Amen. And these garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat and a mitre and a girdle, they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and purple, blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make an ephod of gold, <clears throat> of blue and of purple and scarlet and fine twined linen with cunning work. So this is a very intricate embroidered work, lots of threads being twisted and, and woven around and it's done in such a pleasing way that it attracts the eye, but it blends with everything else. Mm -hmm. Very intricate. Mm -hmm. Like a brocade, you know, raised work, knit together, fitly framed, all these sorts of ideas. And it shall have two shoulder pieces thereof, joined at two edges thereof, and so they shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold and of blue and of purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. Now the, the curious girdle, I think this is the only place in Scripture where that word is used mm -hmm. in this context. <clears throat> I mean, there were curious arts, yeah. right. you know, but, girdle, but the curious girdle, right. and if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, there's not even a Strong's number for it. Mm -hmm. It's just something that they... Yeah. They understood it to be something unique mm -hmm. and something intricate and something more than met the eye. And that shall take two onyx stones, engrave them, the names of the children of Israel, six <clears throat> of their names on one stone, and on the other six names of the rest of the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shall thou engrave of the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, which shall make them to be set in ouches of gold. And an ouch is a, a woven pattern mm -hmm. that holds something in place. Mm -hmm. So it's like a setting, mm -hmm. only it's made with fabric or with strands. Mm -hmm. But of course it's an ouch. Are you familiar with ouches, mm -hmm. Sister Yost? I know I am. <laughs> So as God is setting his, his fine jewels into the bless, breastplate of the high priest, it involves some pain and suffering, mm -hmm. if you will. Indulge me, an ouch. <clears throat> and that will be more apparent as we further describe this garment. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for the stones of a memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. You talk about having your heart on your sleeve. Yeah. Well, God had his people yeah. on, on prominent display. He's, he, <laughs> you put something on your shoulders, what do you do with it? You carry them. <laughs> so he's like the, the good shepherd. He carries that lamb. Mm -hmm. Gonna make sure that we, we make it yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. And thou shalt make ouches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends and a, a wreathen work and thou shalt make them and fasten the wreathen chains to the ouches and thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work after the work of the ephod thou shalt make it of gold, blue, purple and scarlet so these things are repeated time and time again gold of course is precious purple and scarlet that's royalty Right? Mm -hmm. 
And what do we know about blue? By the blueness of the wound. Right? That is, uh, yeah. the blueness of the wound cleanses away evil. So stripes the inward parts of the belly. Blue. It's part of the priesthood. That's Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30. Blue. And thou shalt set it in setting of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardis, a topaz, a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. The second shall be an emerald, a sapphire, a diamond. The third row, a ligure, an agate, an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. I compared this to the foundations of the... Mm -hmm. the and wow. there is some overlap, but they're not exact. Right. So I don't know what to make of that except to to say in passing, there is a commonality, but it's not a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. Mm -hmm. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with the, his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. Thou shalt make them upon the breastplate chains at the ends of the wreath and work <clears throat> of pure gold, and thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and as you continue on down, you'll find out that everything is integrated and put together and made into a unit, mm -hmm. tied together by gold chains. And thou shalt bind the breastplate by the rings thereof under the rings of the ephod with the lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. So it's bound with a blue cord mm -hmm. so that it does not get loosed from the ephod. The ephod is the undergarment of the priest and the girdle is integrated with it so that when the, the priest is working, the breastplate is always there. That's called the breastplate of judgment. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel, the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth into the holy place for memorial before the Lord continually. So we're upon the Lord's heart as his people continuously. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now there's a, 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 a psalm that says that uh, judgment shall return unto righteousness and the upright in heart shall follow after it. Mm -hmm. So re re <clears throat> remember, excuse me, the purpose of judgment is not to destroy. The purpose of judgment is to restore righteousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those that will not be informed or corrected by judgment will ultimately be destroyed. Right. Yeah. But God will give you many instances. I had a Ram Award the other day. Urim. It was this. One of the uh, apostles asking Jesus, Hey, if my brother sins against me, <clears throat> shall I forgive him seven times? He said, Not seven times, but seventy times seven. Now that was the imperative to the man compassed with infirmity. How much more does the husbandman of that word satisfy that requirement? So how gracious, how forgiving, how patient do you think Jesus really is? If we're compelled to forgive 70 times 7 in a day, how much does he Day with the Lord is a thousand years. Think about they that. Merciful. Just think about that. <laughs> yeah. Just think about that. Right. He's the, the the God of all grace, the Father yeah. of mercies, all those things. But He is so merciful. Thank you, Father. And right. in that, Amen. I take great solace because mm -hmm. I know I need His mercy. Mm -hmm. I truly do. Amen. So <clears throat> we have the the breastplate <clears throat> upon His heart. God judges us with the intent of returning us to righteousness. He's married to the backslider. His thoughts for you are thoughts of peace and not of evil. All those things. Contained in those judgments 
are the revelation of his word and the working out of his good pleasure in your life, the Urim and the Thummim. He's going to show you what's right. He's going to illuminate it to you personally. Yes. And then he's going to impress upon you indelibly mm -hmm. through an experience, the truth of his word. Mm -hmm. And he's going to do that because he loves you. Yes. You're upon his heart. That's the high priest. We have a great high priest. Mm -hmm. And we are priests as well with him. Priests in training, <clears throat> if you want to say that. Some, some, uh, some of us are further advanced, others not so good. On any given day, you know, you may look at me and say, what are you talking about, brother? You have no right to say any of this. <laughs> but all I can tell you is that every child of God is in that kingdom. A kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a peculiar people, peculiar and curious I got a good scripture for you. Give me that scripture. Unto him that loved us and washed, washed us from our sins, sins in his own, own blood. blood. Amen. And made us kings, kings and priests and priest unto God and his father. And his, father. his father. Hallelujah. Glory forever. Excellent scripture in which to end. Because I think uh, that pretty well says what I wanted to say tonight. And may the Lord bless you all and administer this truth to your heart. Mm hmm. You know, he's the husbandman. He's been through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can, uh, when you think about anything that you've been through, Jesus has the more. Amen. You know, Paul said, I the more. Mm -hmm. Jesus really the more. Amen. All right. Well, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Glory to your name. Amen. I bless you. Amen. In the mighty name.